morning. Thank you for those of you who are attending. Our first session today will be on pelvic pain, and we have two great speakers to, uh, to be involved in this. So our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Brooks, who's a consultant at UCLH and an interventional radiologist. He's had a very interesting career since his appointment in 1998, where he's been a clinical mm -hmm. tutor and associate lecturer in Barbados in the University of West Indies, and he set up an interventional radiology program there. And at the moment, he's uh, currently at radiology at UCLH. His main research interests in ablation of AV malformations and thermal ablation of varicose veins in teleradiology. So we'll be hearing from uh, Jocelyn Brooks first. Hello, my name is Joe Brooks, and I'm here to talk about pelvic congestion, its diagnosis and management. The Royal College of Gynecologists definition states that pelvic congestion syndrome is a condition of pelvic varicosities in women with unexplained pelvic pain, where it has been suggested as a cause of the chronic pelvic pain. However, there is a great deal of debate as to its definition and associated clinical features. Well, as a definition goes, that's pretty vague and unhelpful. Just to note for later in the talk, that is a transvaginal ultrasound showing enormous venous varicosities around a uterus that is clearly abnormal. So if we're to discuss pelvic pain and pelvic congestion together, as suggested by the Royal College, we need to look at the causes of acute pain and chronic pain and the easy marks go to acute pain where the anatomical organ causing the pain can be identified, the dysfunction identified, diagnosed and treated accordingly. And there you may have infective causes such as cystitis, which uh, notably becomes known as something called interstitial cystitis if it won't go away with antibiotics and it starts to behave unlike an infection prostatitis, orchitis, hemorrhoids are recognized, but there's more to talk about later, and ruptures and bleeds. Well, um, much of this ends up under the care of the urologists, and the chronic pelvic pain tends to go to gynecologists, well, in women anyway. And of the myriad causes as listed for chronic pelvic pain, some of the most uh, notable are pelvic congestion, fibroids, musculoskeletal causes, though if you look at the website, the definition of that is a little obscure, and then some other stuff yeah. which we're not interested in today. So let's have a look at the chronic pelvic pain caused by pelvic venous reflux or pelvic congestion. But before we do that, let's have a look at where interventional radiology contributes to the care of pelvic pain. Here, acute pelvic pain due to a rupture of an ectopic pregnancy. We can see here the appearance of the, the bleed as identified around the ovarian circulation. Here is the bleed, and then clearly identified by catheterization of the ovarian artery, and ultimately it can be embolized. Or a, an agnexal or GI bleed can be identified, super selectively catheterized, and embolized. And sometimes this is uh, ruptures that can occur to the adnexy following sex or sudden onset of pelvic pain in an older woman with myeloma, where imaging can identify the bleed in an unexpected place, and then angiographically, here we are coronally, we can identify it coming off the internal iliac artery and super selectively catheterize with intention to embolize using the 
back door and front door blockage concept, such that the that's how it was, and now it's eliminated. These are acute pelvic pain where the cause is identified and IR can help in its treatment. Just to throw this in, because you may not be aware of it, what about hemorrhoidal artery embolization for what are known as internal hemorrhoids, which is really a chronic proctitis of the inner cushions where the bleeding can be clearly identified on angiography and embolized, allowing healing of the hemorrhoids. But what if the pain does persist beyond six months and we're not really sure of the cause? Then it becomes known as chronic pelvic pain. And here's a list I pinched from the Mayo Clinic, but it's almost exactly the same as the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, where we have a whole list starting with a long paragraph trying to explain endometriosis. Um, rather interestingly, it's either present on MRI and other diagnostic scans, but its absence on the scans does not imply the absence of the condition. Well, you go figure. Musculoskeletal problems, et cetera, et cetera. But of the stuff that can be contributed to, what about pelvic congestion? Again, a rather mealy-mouthed explanation. Fibroids we know about. And all these are all rather disappointing labels. Here I've summarized them, remembering that pelvic congestion may be present in 30 or even 40% of women. So it's got to be one worth checking out early. And fibroids, incredibly common. Again, worth checking out early because these are things that we understand and things we can treat as opposed to other conditions which lead to more chin rubbing. And so if we're looking at chronic pelvic pain and its causes, if we look at the simple stuff that's incredibly common, we're accounting for maybe 90% of the cases of chronic pelvic pain and pelvic venous reflux accounts for nearly 40%. So surely, worth checking out. So what is it? It's incredibly common. It appears to be inherited as an autosomal dominant in that it runs through true through families. One manifestation of it is varicose veins. But that's only varicose veins of the legs that we vaguely heard of. But there are many other manifestations of chronic venous insufficiency, which seems to be a mild connective tissue disorder, a bit like Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos, but of the veins, not the arteries. All veins may be affected and leads to a progressive weakness of the vein walls and valves. It's not sex-linked, men get it as much as women, but it may manifest more in women because they have a vasoactive hormonal menstrual cycle and are more likely to get pregnant with a 50% increase in circulating blood volume and then a big gravid uterus sat on the final outflow of the IVC. So if you have any weakness of the veins, it's likely to manifest after pregnancy and certainly after multiple pregnancies. So how does it present? Well, chronic venous insufficiency is a gravitational issue. So we choose to stand upright, even though we're designed as a quadruped. And so anywhere below the heart is fair game. The gonadal veins in men are recognized to undergo varicele dilatation. We call it a varicocele. Well, surprise, surprise, women get varicoceles too, but their testes are tucked inside. And so we don't take too much notice of them. But a varicocele in a man is a pelvic vein reflux in a woman. And in a, whim, a woman, if you have reflux and poor venous return from 
the uterus, ovaries, and associated organs that can present as menorrhagia, premenstrual symptoms of pain, uh, vaginal varicose veins with dyspyunia, and vulval varices, together with um, evidence of reflux in the internal iliac venous territories of gluteal reflux into the buttocks that we describe as low back pain just before period, hemorrhoids, painful erections in men, such as the, uh, similar to the dyspyunia in women, and then spilling out into the legs and inner thighs into varicose veins. So what about pelvic congestion specifically um, as part of the spectrum of chronic venous insufficiency? Well, recurrent varicose veins uh, is a phrase we're familiar with. About 10% will recur in the first year after strip surgery, rising to 50% recurrence at five years in the old school way of doing varicose veins, where you only treat from the saphenofemoral junction in the groin downwards and ignore the 10% of pelvic venous reflux spilling over into the veins. The association of worsening of leg varicose vein symptoms with period suggests a pelvic origin. The exacerbation of venous issues with pregnancy suggests a pelvic origin. And the classic venous pattern of pain, which is it gets worse during the day when you're standing, and it's relieved overnight by lying down. The presence of massive great veins in the pelvis, um, even though it often is dismissed as being normal or irrelevant on an ultrasound scan, such as the ultrasound I showed you at the beginning, um, but those large abnormal veins in the pelvis suggests large and abnormal pains, uh, veins in the pelvis. An incomplete response to hormonal suppression, but some improvement if you suppress the vasoactive menstrual cycle may produce some improvement in the symptoms of pelvic pain. Again, hmm, what about the veins? Analgesics don't really help. We accept that men get pelvic vein reflux in varicocele, but fail to recognize it. And the location of veins, which clearly is above the saphenofemoral junction, such as around the buttocks and the vulva, um, defying gravity. Again, the leak must come from above. So we end up with a constellation of very varied symptoms symptoms, syndromes, and troublesome symptoms that don't seem to go away and don't have any explanation until you consider chronic venous insufficiency, which unites them all, and suddenly the penny drops. So in the clinic, how do we, how do we identify this? Well, we look for causes of premenstrual tension and bloating and menorrhagia, upper thigh pain, at the beginning of menstrual <laughs> low back pain, but at the onset of menstrual period, swelling of the ankles and symptoms in the legs. Guess what? In the premenstrual phase, dyspyunia, hemorrhoids in pregnancy, vulval varices in pregnancy, and recurrent varicose veins, especially around the inner thigh and vulva. Think veins. <laughs> So we've done a history which is incredibly strong in identifying the problem. Um, if we examine, we look for the pattern of uh, varicose veins around the vulva, coming out of the buttocks, non um generalized pattern of leg veins, if that's where it's manifesting, and we can send them for um, uh, diagnostic tests. Duplex ultrasound is very powerful, as it is for male varicocele with blooming on Valsalva. Um, well, you can see the same thing in the um, uh, blooming in on Valsalva. 
in either transabdominal or even better transvaginal scanning. CT is not immediately useful and ascending varicography obviously has its uses, but it's not a first stage diagnostic test. MR venography, particularly looking at water, such as with a stir or T2 fat sat sequence, is very good at showing uh, the presence of varices, but also can be used to exclude other causes of pelvic pain, such as endometriosis, fibroids, etc. And ultimately, they will come to dynamic pelvic venography for both final diagnosis and simultaneous treatment. So what does this look like? The duplex scan here showing previous stripping of the long saphenous veins and here classic post-surgical stripping angiogenic regrowth. However, here is new veins coming down from the pelvis, from the pelvis. And here, the 3% annual increase just because you've got chronic venous insufficiency anyway is the anterior thigh vein becoming insufficient and incompetent but here we go the duplex scan just of the legs shows that it's coming from the pelvis the mri can show you the left gonadal vein if i told you it was a man you'd say oh yes it's a varicocele here it is in transverse section showing the parametrial varices even with phleboliths because of the stagnation of the blood and its clotting and unclotting leading to stone formation. And here again on the MRI, vulval varices. Here we are in sagittal section on the MRI, seeing the cluster of veins coming off the internal iliac. And as we come forward, we see the cluster of varices around the uterus and the bladder, and ultimately coming down the vagina and spilling onto the vulva. A little film for you. MRI time resolved sequence. There's the arteries. Wait a moment. And here is the left gonadal vein. And here the, um, the varices, the parametrial, and ultimately flowing down the vulva. Let's see it sagittally, because I know you're not convinced yet. Here come the arteries. And now, in venous phase, here you can see the veins and then down the vagina towards the vulva. Um, what about CT? You can often pick up gonadal vein varices, but you wouldn't go looking for it with CT, even though you can pick it up. Um, because people have so many CTs. Here's another volume rendering of a CT. It's very useful for complex recurrence of varicose veins. Here you can see the channels coming down from the pelvis, coming down from the pelvis to these recurrent, tortuous inner thigh varices, showing you that if you're going to treat these varicose veins, you need to treat the refluxing source in the pelvis, the pelvic congestion. So we did a little test some years at UCH in the clinic, over six patients undergoing varicose vein surgery had a duplex scan and clinical review. The duplex scan suggested that the varices were filling from pelvic tributaries. They progressed to the venography for as gold standard for co confirmation. 95% correlation. So if you think it's a pelvic source and you've got a duplex scan confirming that, it is. So it's very powerful. And then which when people talk about ovarian vein, well, it's not only the ovarian vein, and clearly the left ovarian vein is the most popular, but it's a selection of both gonadal veins and both internal iliac venous territories, of which there are several branches, remember. So what does pelvic venography look like? Well, it's a day case under local anesthetic via a cannula in the right internal jugular vein, which I know is unfamiliar, but that's the way we do it. We look at both gonadal and both deep iliac vein territories, we catheterize them and test them under pressure, which is why it's under local, so that the 
the patient can valsalva during the procedure to test the functionality of the valves. And then having displayed the refluxing area, we can sclerose and coil it. This is some examples of a left gonadal vein being coiled. Here's reflux down to the vulva with vulval varices. Here, a, the large refluxing mat around the uterus and vagina in a woman with menorrhagia dyspareunia. And this was treated by sclerotherapy primarily. Or here, a woman multigravid with bilateral legs swelling as her presentation, as well as perineal pain. And here is all the reflux around the perineum and so on in the process of being addressed. Recurrent varicose veins, I mentioned the angiogenic mat. Luckily, we don't see this too often now because we don't do surgical stripping. So it heals in a different way without um, angiogenesis after thermal ablation. And just to say, here's a, a man with a similar thing, but of course it presents slightly differently. You don't have all the clues about pregnancy and menstruation, but nonetheless, men get this too. Um, in sagittal plane, you can see the reflux into the gluteal muscles in and down to the hemorrhoids, the hemorrhoidal veins, which remember can be accessed from below by a surgeon with a needle. But unless you're going to close off this reflux from above, you're not going to get happiness with those venous hemorrhoids either. Two more films for you. This one showing with Valsalva maneuver and why it's important, an angiogenic mat refluxing down to the leg. And generally, for somebody with bilateral leg pain and swelling, now you start to see with Valsalva, you can see down into the left leg and we can close it off with sclerosin and a coil at the top. Remember this one? This was a difficult to get into left over, left over there, but I, I failed to get in the first time. You can see it there. And the reason I'm showing that to you is because here we are now treating it guided by that MRA. Difficult to get into at the top of the left gonadal because some complex joining there, but eventually we got through into the same pattern as demonstrated there it is the left ovarian vein parametrial varices and we we're able then to sclerose and treat it and by the way a week later she was pregnant because she i phoned her only last week so what about any evidence well the largest meta-analysis um, already getting a bit old now from 2016, but it's British and it's so big. Uh, they looked at chronic pelvic pain, a lot of papers, a lot of studies, and the treatment of, of pelvic pain veins in the manner I've been describing for congestion syndrome. And what they found was that early substantial relief from pain was observed in approximately 75% of women and was sustained. The repeat intervention rates were generally low. Transient pain in recovery was common fo following embolization, but you'd expect that because you're creating uh, fibrosis in order to treat it. And there was a small risk of coil migration. So the complications appear to be limited and uh, to short-term post-operative pain, 
and the risk of coil migration, but with a very high rate of recovery from the chronic pelvic pain that was otherwise undiagnosed and untreated. What about coil migration? <clears throat> it's thought to be somewhere around maybe one in 200 rate, and it is avoided by A, not using so many coils and using more sclerosants, which is the direction of travel, but using detachable coils, being aware of the problem. Um, but it's a small, a small risk that um, is mitigated against by knowledge of its possibility, as in any surgical procedure. So what's the message here? Pelvic venous reflux or congestion is present 30% of adults, and it's exacerbated by men to up to 40% of women. So it's always worth considering in the context of pelvic pain, and certainly chronic pelvic pain in women. Pelvic vein embolization provides symptomatic relief of chronic pelvic pain in the majority of women, and it's safe. Studies report short-term symptomatic relief of up to 87%. Such one group reported 83%. Our own results at UCH were of 85%, but you're getting the idea. And there's a 95% correlation between the duplex and dynamic venography findings at UCH. So we have a strong method of diagnosis with the history and duplex to go ahead and treat where the chief problem is recurrence of varicose veins of the legs, pelvic vein embolization is essential for symptomatic relief and freedom from recurrence. It seems to have a role in the treatment of dysfunctional uterine bleeding, premenstrual tension, chronic pelvic pain in females, and of course in males. Pelvic vein embolization has a role in the treatment of external venous hemorrhoids. And it has a role in the treatment of venous syndromes such as clipotrenorne and vascular malformations, which I haven't burdened you with today. And obviously, better prospective studies defining the technique and refining the technique are needed. So let's remember, what are you asking? People complaining of premenstrual tension and bloating, menorrhagia, upper thigh pains, low back pain, swelling of the legs, dyspyunia, hemorrhoids in pregnancy, vulval varices in pregnancy, recurrence of varicose veins, all of which is exacerbated at the onset of menstruation. Think veins. It's so common. You might as well exclude it. And you can do that with a duplex scan. And if it turns out that it's a high possibility of a pelvic venous engorgement and congestion, and the treatment is pelvic venography and embolization. Remember that IR has a contribution to all aspects of gynecology, and I'm sure we'll be discussing a lot of this uh, in the course of this joint meeting, but certainly where it comes to chronic pelvic pain, if we can eliminate fibroids and pelvic venous congestion, then we're going a long way to defeating the concept of chronic pelvic pain and simply getting on and treating the problem. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you.